Hello. Hi, Natalie. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited to have you. Everyone, welcome. My guest today, this is going to be exciting. He takes people from self-doubt to unstoppable by helping them to reduce anxiety, build confidence, and overcome fears in a very unique way. If, you, if you've not been here before, I'm Natalie Webster, and this is Tonka Talk, where we share the ways people create community and create connection. And my guest today is Joshua Peters from X Factor Hypnosis. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, uh, Natalie. I'm really, like I said, I'm happy to be here and uh, speak with you and your peeps. Yeah, if anybody, if, you know, while we're doing this, we decided to go ahead and do this live today. If you have any questions, go ahead and just throw them up in the chat. I have a million questions myself about this. I know very little about hypnosis beyond you know, what I see in the movies and television. And I think of the stereotypical, you know, watch my watch swing while you, Mm -hmm. while you are getting sleepy and something tells me that is not what you do. (laughs) No, I don't even own a stop or a a pocket watch. (laughs) (laughs) How would you just, how would you describe what it is that you do? I think of myself as a coach first and foremost, Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I kind of approach my work in, in a, in basically in a three-step process. So one of the things that I do, and one of the most important things is I'm going to teach my clients a bunch of different tools, things yeah. that they can do really consciously to interrupt whatever those patterns are that is, are getting in their way. So a, a lot of times I'm working with somebody with anxiety or with some different types of uh, specific fears or phobias that are getting in their way. And so these these tools are designed then to help them interrupt those automatic responses, kind of take you out of, I think of it like a fight or flight response into a into a calm response. So oh. that's, that's one of the things that I do. At, but then if you talk about hypnosis, right, then that's what we're talking about here. The next step is really to get at what's the unconscious program's that are running like what is underneath here that is driving the the behaviors the beliefs or the habits that's happening and the way that hypnosis does that it, we use you we use words we use visualizations we use directly speaking to the unconscious mind metaphors storytelling there's lots of ways to do that and it's mostly just through my language, speaking to my clients and they're giving feedback. So I'm not taking over their mind. I'm guiding them again. It's more like a coaching process, but sure. in the end, it's really very, very simple. And there's a neuroscience behind it. Can you touch a little bit on that? Yeah. In a way that I can track and understand. <laughs> yeah. if, this, if this track. So we talk about the problem mm-hmm. that alone activates the neurons that are connected to that problem. So okay. uh, think of it like this, like if you're having, uh, tell me about one of your most f- uh, happy childhood memories. Uh, that would probably be on the beach at my grandma's house in Hawaii where she lived. She lived on an awesome yeah. beach when I was little and I just loved going there. And that's where I yeah. learned how to swim in the ocean. Right. And I can see in your response you're connecting with the, that moment. You're connecting with those feelings, right? That's activating the neurons based, related to that particular time. And that and it brings up the feelings, right? So we talk about yeah. the problem, which activates the neurons in the problem state, not what we're doing, not what I just did with you, but a similar process. And then we use this hypnotic, all these different hypnotic techniques to send those neurons down a new pathway pathway of calm, um, a path is that, of confidence, of, of peace of mind. That's how you rewire the brain. That's the neuroscience behind how all types of change work actually work. What is it that adds that step of hypnosis? You know, because when you, you, like you're saying, when you're having, you're having this conversation mm-hmm. and, and, and I'm under, I'm tracking with you on how then that rewires the brain. So if you're talking about things, if you're with a client and you're discussing things that are troubling or upsetting things from their past. Mm-hmm. So are you saying that as you address those things and go through it, would you call that in a hypnotic state or how, what does that look like? Yeah. So it helps, I think, to consider it, to, to take the word hypnosis away because that, that has a lot of, 
it has both positive and negative connotations to it. Mm -hmm. And it's really what we're talking about here is a trance state. Mm. Okay. We're going in and out of trance states all of the time. In fact, you're probably in a little bit of a trance state doing this recording because you're like on, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> when, when, you, when you just pop back to that moment at your grandma's at the beginning, mm -hmm. it took you into a particular state of consciousness. That's what we're talking about here, different states of consciousness. A hypnotic state of consciousness tends to be feel pretty relaxed. It, it's a focused state of relaxation is how it's often described mm -hmm. where you now have access to this deeper part of you, call it the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind, or we don't even really know what it is. We know it works. Exactly how it works is a little bit different of a question, but what it seems to me is it takes you into a more focused, relaxed state where I can say positive things to you now, and you're going to really hear them at your core. Like mm -hmm. there's a, you're going to maybe have an experience connecting with a, a younger version of you that's going to make a huge impact on you. You're going to see yourself going through a situation where in the past it used to show up with the challenge, but now it shows up where you're showing up the way you want to, thinking the way you want to think, feeling the way you want to feel. We're building up this pathway. We're, we're taking a, think of it like a future memory. We're, we're building up how you're going to be. So now when you're in the situation, the pathway's already there and it becomes the default. Wow. So it really is not kind of this hocus pocus kind of thing. It's that this is, this is actual science. Yeah. I've been learning more about building these neural pathways and different, different treatments and therapies that people do in order to do that. And it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that is really kind of the new cutting edge way of addressing things like trauma, but even what you're talking about with anxiety and those types of issues that rewiring our brains, because wasn't it before we didn't even know that that was possible? Uh, there's been so much advances in neuroscience, even in just the past, in the past 10 years, but in the, even in the past five years, we haven't even really been able to measure how the brain is working until very recently. So now we can see in the brain what's happening in a meditation, what's happening in hypnosis, what's happening in all these different uh, states like physically what are the what are what's firing in the brain where before we had, we couldn't we couldn't measure that we were making guesses so now <laughs> these things that you could see results happening but nobody really knew how it was working or why it was working but it worked now we're able to measure that and have a much better ability to to really pinpoint these things so when you're working with someone and if they're looking at something, you know, like when you asked me a question, that was a very pleasant thing to go ahead and yeah. and remember and recall. Mm -hmm. If someone's dealing with something like anxiety that they know is, you know, tied back to something previously in childhood, the way that you guide them when you're in that trance state, is it easier for that person to connect with those memories? So first of all, if they have a really traumatic memory, I am not going to go back and make them relive it because there's lots of ways to actually to do this. So if I think of somebody that has a, say, say they had a traumatic experience, or I like to think of them as past experiences just because that's what it really is. And yeah. we're labeling it as a traumatic experience, but it's really just a past experience. So somebody has this past experience that left an impact and now they're feeling anxious when they're in situations that are sort of similar to that yeah. because this pathway is, is there. What, sure. what I would do rather than going back to that memory, like we don't have to go back to the memory to activate the neurons. All we have to do is talk about the last time that the anxiety happened and that's enough to light those up. So we don't actually have to go into traumatic events and relive them. I don't want you to have to do that. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to make it like to go through these kinds of processes that don't require us to fully activate a hugely traumatic experience. Like there's no need to go through that again if we don't have to. 
That makes a lot of sense, especially given, like you were saying, the how much science and things have changed with what we've learned about how the brain works and how you can actually rewire these neural pathways. It it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, cognitive behavioral therapy with the reframing. Yeah. In that that and and other ways too. I was talking with my sister the other day, who's doing uh, ketamine infusion therapy. Sure. And rewiring the brains. Can you tell me? I was looking on your website. And it was, uh, of course, now I'm forgetting what it was called. Psychedelic, in- uh, what was it? Integration. What? Psychedelic integration. Yeah. You, of course, that got my attention. Psychedelic integration. Yeah. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. So psychedelic experiences can be very life-changing. Like people, that's why people are doing the ketamine. That's why uh, psilocybin is becoming a, a very lo- much looked at uh, therapy because what psychedelics do is they create this huge ability of neuroplasticity in the brain. So it it makes your brain starts to make all of these different connections in ways that it hasn't done before. So it makes it very, very flexible. So it's a similar thing that hypnosis does too, is it, it kind of opens you up to a, a neuroplastic type of experience where things can start to make new connections can form. Yeah. Um, with psychedelics, that can last for quite a while after you have the initial medicine. So I, I've heard of that. People with PTSD even doing these studies with 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 mushrooms and having the benefits way after taking the actual correct you know, medication slash drug itself. Right. It's not the kind of it's not a medicine that you take every day to it's like a like a typical anti anxiety medicine it's Mm kind of like shutting down emotions and feelings so that you don't feel the anxiety sure where a psilocybin or magic mushrooms it's going to create new pathways so that those old pathways of anxiety they just aren't even working anymore so it's a very different idea very Mm -hmm. different way of doing the the healing yeah. And uh, so so that's kind of what that does. So psychedelic integration, what I've noticed is a lot of people will have these really powerful psychedelic experiences and they it's almost like they put them in a box like, OK, well, that was there. And over here is life. And then when you're done with this, you kind of go back to life and fall back into the same patterns and things. You may have had some amazing uh ideas and and inspirations and uh wisdoms that came out of this but they're not getting applied into life what what psychedelic what hypnotic psychedelic integration is is just using hypnosis so we're not using the medicines this is for somebody who's already had an experience Mm -hmm. we're using hypnosis to take you back to that moment to very to slow it down because a psychedelic experience can feel like all this stuff is happening just too, too fast to really be able to, to catch it all. Yeah. So we go back, we slow the experience down, we just pull out what is the learnings, what, what were the lessons, and then we take those lessons and we apply them in your life. Now, what I've noticed doing this with, with clients is they might have some other kind of challenge in their life that has nothing to do with, with this but as we apply this over here, it has everything to do with it. Wow. And they're, and they're, they're getting insights. They're getting wisdom from this thing that might have happened years ago. And they're getting it now and utilizing it now in their experiences now. So it's just, I, I'm very interested in trance of all types, including the psychedelics and hypnosis and breath work, all the different ways that you can create a trance state. And I'm... Uh, I, I'm just fascinated with how we can use these different trances to really empower ourselves. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how how using these type of techniques and what you do relates to, you know, when you talk about anxiety, um, let's just kind of start there with anxiety, how maybe this type of this type of treatment or hypnosis, not necessarily psychedelic integration, but mm-hmm. the idea of, you know, doing what you do and working with the people that you work with. It's so it's so amazing to me. And I've seen this happen. Like I've seen 
like I said, my sister's doing ketamine infusion therapy for her PTSD from from growing up and being in a cult that we were both in and yeah. left in adulthood. And she's had a lot of struggles and especially with anxiety to the point where it was even hard for her to leave the house. Yeah. And she tried. She had done so many different forms of therapy. And though it helped her, it didn't seem to really kind of get on top of this this anxiety. And she tried different medications and some she still takes too. But this ketamine infusion therapy, I, I don't even fully understand how it works. But along with what you're saying, with it rewiring and opening up those pathways, yeah. her anxiety level went down tremendously. Yeah. And I was shocked at how quickly it happened. It it just seems like this is really the way to, you know, so much of it, so many people, we deal with anxiety and these fears and it gets in the way in, in daily yeah. life with what we yeah. want to do, what we want to be, what we want to create. Can you kind of give some examples of, you know, kind of how the, all my examples go back to, I was in a cult. How can you help me deal with that? <laughs> But if we get a little more general, right, and just yeah. in terms of anxiety, how that can help somebody that maybe is struggling with anxiety because of their past or where they came from. I'll give you a couple of different examples of clients that I've worked with. Uh, one of them is uh, he, he's a comedian and he was having trouble going on stage and giving trying new material that was his anxiety was he would he wanted to try new material and so he would plan to do it he'd have it all written out and he'd go up on the stage and he'd go back to the old the old stuff that he knew was going to get laughs that he knew was going to work and he kept he was getting really frustrated with himself as we started to work together it got really clear that this wasn't just anxiety showing up on stage. Yes, that was kind of where he was really noticing it, but he was dealing with anxiety in a lot of areas of life. So we te I taught him these tools. We start with the tools. That's the best place to start because now you have something you can do. And the tools, are, they're interrupting the pattern, but they're also helping to create the new pattern. So we start with those tools, but then there's things that happen in life that you know, just kick you in the balls. Exactly. Like, and then we make something up about it. Like we make up about, make something up about ourself or we make something up about life. And then That's we- sure why that happened. Yeah. Then we act like it's true. And a lot of times this happens when we're kids. And so we are living now for the rest of our life with the belief that something is true based on what a four-year-old had with the resources a four-year-old had at the time. And we can go, our people go their whole lives holding on to those, you know, not those f false beliefs <laughs> as if they're true. So with, with the hypnotic work, you can, you can release that stuff. You can let that go. You can revisit a moment in life and give that version of you everything that they actually needed in that moment so they can go through it differently. Now, it doesn't mean that we obviously can't change the past, but when you do that, it removes all the charge from that situation. It just made, it just was now it just becomes something that happened. It becomes it like you said, a meaning to it. Yeah. A past memory versus a traumatic experience. Yeah. And in fact, it can become an empowering memory Whoa. when it's framed in the right way. And when you, and when you ex re-experience it in a new way, right? I got to wrap my head around that one. So it's fascinating. So you're saying like these, these decisions that we make about ourselves, who we are or how something is based on things that happen to us, like your example of the four-year-old. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you make decisions and you have feelings about who you are. And we carry those throughout our life, still kind of stuck in that, through that four-year-old eyes. Yeah. But you're saying with this type of, of hypnosis therapy and with with coaching and how you do it, you're opening up the pathways, but then also giving people tools to have another way to look at it. But by going through the process, you're saying then they could look at these things and it wouldn't be just such this heavy thing because sometimes they're really hard to look at. And it's amazing to me to think that it can, you know, like what you said, that hit me hard. Like when we're children going through these things, mm -hmm how they stick with us. I'm going to just read a comment here. Jennifer says, Hey, y'all, how you, 
Hey, y'all. How you darlings? Oh, I love that. Doing today. The subject has always been fascinating to me. I am surprised there isn't more folks here. You'll get a lot of plays after people get home from work, I bet. I bet too. Thank you, Jennifer. And for everyone who who is with us, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat. Because while we have Joshua, we may as well ask yeah. and get all those questions going. So by all means, send your uh, send in your questions Real for life. This is fantastic information. Thank you. We hope you enjoy it. Nancy, working and lurking. That's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> Got to be multitasking. Um, what else can you share in terms of, are there any type of tools, anything that you can share now or that people can utilize to kind of, you know, like put a toe into this to learn more about it? Yeah, there there are a couple of really simple things and, you know, I'll usually, one of the tools that I usually teach my clients is a type of breath work that mm -hmm. can take you, I, I, I markety wise, I call it the, the two minute breathing exercise that eliminates overthinking because, because it can really do that. It's a, it literally will take two minutes to do this process and it can change your life if you make it into a practice. It's uh, can you show it to me now? Yeah, I mean, it's simple. I'll, uh, and I'll give you as as a gift for your listeners. I've got two gifts, and Ooh. uh, this isn't if you go to this website right now, it's not going to work, but give me an hour and it will be working for you. So just go to xfactorhypnosis.com slash talk and talk, and it will take you to a place where you put in an email and then it'll give you these two free gifts. So one of them, it's it's a breathing exercise. I'll I'll tell you what it is right now. It's called mm -hmm. the four, seven, eight breath. Okay. And it's it, the essential of it is it's a four count inhale, a seven count hold, and then an eight count exhale. So if you think about it, it's really like a, a quick, deep inhale, and then a really long exhale. Now, there there's some things that make it best practice, but that's that's the essential. That's the opposite of anxiety breath. Right. Anxiety breath is usually short, shallow, yeah. up in the top of our lungs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and this is the opposite of that. This is a, a a technique that will calm your mind and it'll take you out of a fight or flight response, which is what an anxiety response is, down to kind of an, into an alpha state. So an alpha state is like a light meditation or like a daydreamy kind of state. Uh, between awake and asleep, a flow kind of a state. That's about what a what an alpha state is, and that's the best place to come from when you're dealing with any kind of challenge in your life. So you're saying even something that simple, if we find ourselves in a fight or flight and really anxious, can kind of help to bring the noise down, yeah, and quiet things. And is there a way? I'm curious about this. I don't want to get too technical because I want to be able to understand it. Yeah. But I'm curious as to what is that correlation between, you know, breathing and slowing down our breathing and slowing down our mind at the same yeah. time? Because they definitely seem to go together. And I know when I've experienced anxiety and I've had a couple of panic attacks and it just that you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The way you breathe is so different. It's almost like you can't get air, just this yeah. kind of a thing. Breath is the only automatic part of our body, an automatic part of our nervous system that we have any control over. We can't control our heart rate. We can't control our our sweating, our temperature. I know that. Right? <laughs> but you can control your breath. Now, what people forget is that they can control their breath. Yeah. And what tends to happen is our emotional state shifts our physical state, but our physical state can also shift our emotional state. So by slowing down your breath, that starts to slow down your heart rate, that starts to get you out of your head, back into your body, where you're <laughs> present. Because when you're in an anxiety state, you're not present. You're That's spinning true. down made up stuff, what ifs, worries, you know, all the all those things, making up stories about what's about to happen or what might happen or what did happen and and digging into it and really feeling into it. And I'm just feeling it and forgetting that we have some control over all of that. Wow. That, like you were able to access that that positive memory just like that. Mm-hmm. 
we can do that in those moments too. If we can interrupt the pattern, you know, if we can interrupt the automatic response, we can take a, like, that's that a great way to make a change is when you find yourself in a spiral, yeah, interrupt it, use the breath technique, and then think of a moment when you were just happy and go into it so that you can really feel it in your body. That alone is going to rewire those neurons. Because if you think about it, what we did was we activated the neurons, mm -hmm. we changed state, and we sent the neurons down a new pathway. That's wow. change work right there. That makes sense. Uh, Nancy Alley has a question. During this therapy, is there a chemical response when you bring people back to an event from the past? So, well, I, I'm not measuring that in my office, and mm -hmm. I don't know how much of a chemical response there would be when when I'm taking when when I want people to kind of bring up that memory I'm only doing it enough to get those neurons activated so I'm not going to take somebody deep into a traumatic experience if we did and they got thrown into fight or flight yes <laughs> they're going to have adrenaline flowing through them they're going to have the stress hormones cortisol is going to be flowing through them they're going to be filled with the cocktail of chemicals which is what happens when you're in an anxious response so i'm not trying to get that deep i want to i want to bring you just enough to get the neurons activated but not to go into that fight or flight response. Which is so amazing because in the past, traditional therapy has really been that kind of let's go, you know, dive into these and, and relive these memories. I know that when I started learning about neuroplasticity and being able to rewire your brain, I found it so fascinating and helpful and I actually had neurologists, two neurologists at the University of Minnesota suggest, not suggest, but tell me that they now know these things can be done. Mm. And especially with people with, with tra trauma in their past, PTSD, you know, a lot of anxiety and, and, and depression. And it just blew my mind because when they, it was a little overwhelming at first, because at first they're like, you know, therapy and really, you know, feeling your feelings and processing these things because they, in my situation, they'd asked me if I'd ever been in the military because what was going on with me and the way it was physically affecting me, they often see in veterans, people who've done multiple tours of duty. Yeah. And I hadn't said anything about growing up in a cult yet or anything like that. <laughs> Not usually my opening with a new doctor. But then I told them a little bit about it and they're like, yeah. And, you know, those things need to be processed. And the first thing I thought of was, I don't have the time or the energy to go back and relive these things because I wasn't understanding exactly what they were saying, but they were basically saying what you're saying here, the science behind it has more to do with activating the neurons and giving them new pathways yeah. where it's not necessary to heal from this, to have to go relive the whole thing. Right. Well, that got me super excited. Uh, Jennifer says, I suffer from chronic pain oh, and I have fibromyalgia and CRP, CRPS, and I use color therapy, literally coloring. Me too, girl. I use pencils and other things like breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend for pain? Ooh, that's a great question, Jennifer. So there are, what I would suggest as far as pain is uh, a, a couple of things. If you don't have a, a meditation practice, I would start some kind of mindfulness practice, first of all something else that's been really helpful for some of the pain clients that I've worked with. And, you know, this is, this doesn't work for everybody. I don't know if this will work for Jennifer or not, but consider calling it instead of pain. Um, oh, I just lost my word. Call it. Uh, kind of like how you were talking about too, with these past traumatic experiences and referring to them as past experiences. Yeah. Yep. Because you, as as you work through it and you rewire and you send these neurons somewhere else, that there there's truth in that. Because there's things that I can even look at in my past where some not so much, but there are some that definitely at the time and later I thought, oh my gosh, that's massively traumatic. I don't want to look at that. And then through different work, was able to look at it and then talk about it. And I think sometimes that's why. I'll, the more people that I got to know outside of my cult, I grew up in Scientology and left, as I got to know people outside of that, I would share not in a way of like, oh, here's this traumatic experience. I would just be like, oh, yeah, well, this, this, this happened. 
but very matter matter of fact. And the look on their face told me (laughs) (laughs) this is not normal. I almost had the opposite problem in a way of not recognizing certain things as being undesirable or traumatic because I was so used to staying in fight or flight. Yeah. 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 So do you think with pain, it's similar in those ways of how yeah. we're framing it? Well, if you, if you, if, if you think of it as how much pain am I feeling today, your brain is going to go towards, okay, look for, look for the pain. Yeah. How hard, how heavy is it? So if you, if you shame, I can't think of the word I was trying to come up with, but I've got a different one instead. So instead of how much pain am I feeling, ask yourself, okay, what's my level of comfort today? Ooh. Might be a one and that's okay. But yeah. but just by doing that, you're shifting what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the pain or are you focusing on the comfort? Whether or not it's at, you know, a one or a ten doesn't even really matter. It's it's the it's the reference, the frame of reference that you're using or the lens that you're looking through in that moment. Is that because, because I, I definitely believe we get what we focus on. It doesn't follow that that type of universal truth of we get more of where we put our attention. So we're putting our attention only on the much, chain. Very much like that. Yeah. Um, and, and also if you're like, for instance, don't think of a pink elephant. What's the very first thing you do? <laughs> think, of a pink elephant. think of a pink elephant. You first have to think of a pink elephant to put it away. So if you're like saying... I don't want to feel pain. First, your your mind goes, okay, what's pain? Okay, let's not feel that. But you first had to grab it to figure out what it was before you could let it go. Where if you're like, I'd like to feel some more comfort today. What's comfort like? Yeah, that's what I want more of, right? So it is, it is yes, what you focus on is what you get more of. But it's also like how the brain actually works to uh, with language. So let's use language to our benefit. Can you give me some examples of that? What you mean by that? Well, that that was an example right there. Uh, yeah. Another example I, I see from a lot of people is they talk about, like if if I was a client and I'm talking about my anxiety or my pain or yeah. my OCD or whatever it is, they they're it's almost like they they're owning it, they're claiming it as theirs. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be theirs. Doesn't have you don't have to claim it. You don't have to like hold on to this thing you don't want yeah. so tightly. So it doesn't mean now I'm not saying that you're not experiencing that. But if you start to just shift it from my pain to the discomfort I experience or my anxiety to the anxiety that I'm feeling, mm-hmm. it's do you see the difference in how that how that yeah. comes up? It's kind of like how we, you know, people used to refer to autistic children versus children with autism, like just kind of switching the wording there. So you're saying going from saying my pain and the and all of the anxiety, all of my anxiety, switching that to the pain I experienced or the anxiety that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Language is powerful. That is really interesting. Is that a large part, do you find, of what you do, really kind of reworking the language around it? It it comes up with nearly everyone. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's around that. Sometimes I, there's some words that we use. I think of them as disempowering words like have to, need to, should, would, could, even yeah. want to. All of those are implying that you can't have the thing. Yeah, or, definitely. Or, or you're going to rebel against it or somebody's telling you you need to do this. And what I always think, I always say, well, you know, that's what your dad says. And how well does that work? <laughs> <laughs> How's that working for you? As so, Jill always says. so ultimately, really, we make choices. And yeah. everything that we do is a choice that we make. Now, Jennifer says, yes, you frame it different. Thank you. I get what you're saying. LOL. It's hard to do when your doctor wants you to do pain scoring in a pain yeah, journal. I, I understand that. I and think the I, pain I, journal is making it worse. Yeah. Right. Tell them, uh, I'm not going to do a pain journal, but I'll do a comfort journal. Mm. Right. Yeah. I, I would say one of the biggest, that, that pain scale thing that doctors give is, in my opinion, a, a very bad way to help somebody move past pain. 
it's it's a it's a hypnotic suggestion. Doctors are now not that I have anything against doctors, but I don't think they understand the power of their words. I don't yeah. un think they understand how deep of an impact the things that they say can actually mean to their patients. I think you're really right. Do you think that science is catching up today and medicine is catching up more with that concept of that the words that we use are very powerful? Because I feel like I've heard these concepts in, you know, in other when you learn about meditation and other types of work, but I'm hearing it in the medical community now. Mm -hmm. That's what really Blow, blows my mind is everything that you're saying I've heard from at least three different neurologists and every single one encouraged meditation which really made me take another look at it yeah. because these are neurologists I mean who are really good neurologists too <laughs> and a part of this their their healing process with neurological issues and what was going on with me is that type of thing and what you're saying about the words is so interesting because the whole system, and, and as Jennifer was sharing too, it's so set up to reinforce those things. And I know often I've, luckily, fortunately, I found a really good primary and I like my neurologist now too. And they really kind of have more this point of view. And I found I got dramatically better in going, going along that route and doing that ref reframing work and realizing and recognizing basically what you're saying, that these aren't things that I have to hold on to or that I even necessarily need to experience that it doesn't, you know, I think this was a question I had. As you go through the process, do you see with your clients, does it get easier to work that muscle of being able to control you know kind of get these emotions back under control and manage the anxiety is this something that over time gets better uh it, both of those things so you typically the i'll give you an example of i mean this is a relatively simple one but say fear of flying so that that's an anxiety yeah and a lot of times the way that it shows up is for weeks ahead of the flight the the person with that with that fear is thinking about it is worried about all they're checking the weather is this going to be a is there going to be a storm like how am i going to manage this figuring out how they're going to take some medication maybe they're going to fly a day a day ahead of their meeting so that they are they'll be clear-headed when they actually meet people but now they've got to add a couple of days on the like there's a lot that goes into this and they're yeah. right so what and so let's say we've done this work and i i always I require somebody with a fear of flying to have a flight before we're done working together to make sure that we've cleared it up so that if there's anything else we need to deal with, we have the opportunity to still do that. But what typically happens is they, they're getting closer to the date. They're noticing, okay, that's interesting. I'm not feeling that anxiety that I used to feel. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited about this trip. Okay. And they're, and they're all, they're almost, they're like waiting for the anxiety to show up. They, they go to the airport, they're like a, they are in the line They're They get to their, all the things that used to happen just don't happen. And they come out of it completely surprised. That, so that, mm -hmm. that can, so that's a good example of kind of in the moment, but a lot of times anxiety, because it's a little bit more like that's a, that's an on off kind of a, of, a, of an anxiety. Either I have the fear of flying or I don't have the fear of flying. In a more generalized sense, what tends to happen is you might go through an experience where in the past you had the old anxious feeling and you get through it. You don't even realize until hindsight that you got that you showed up differently. So some, sometimes it's just it just happens. Uh, usually through the time that I'm working with somebody from week to week, they're going through experiences where in the past they they didn't show up the way they wanted to, and now they are. Yeah. Or or it's halfway there. They they did pretty good. It was less of a of a challenge. And every one of those the way I like to approach this is finding those specific moments in time, right? So that's how you access the neurons by a moment in time. So if you tell me I am always anxious. There's nothing to hold on to that. That's a nebulous cloud. 
And I think about it kind of like a tabletop. So anxiety is this tabletop. And if we try to just smash the tabletop, we're going to break our hand. Mm. But the legs are what's holding this thing together. And the legs are last week when I went to the store and that person said that thing and it triggered me. That's a leg. That's a moment that we can now reframe, go through, like literally shift. How do you want to be going through this and make that new experience real, bringing up the neurons, sending them down a new pathway and chop down that leg. We do that enough times and the whole table just falls apart and then it doesn't affect you anymore. So it's like Karate Kid, swipe the leg. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) Now, can you, one thing I'm wondering about too, because I don't have a, uh, if there's kind of a simple answer to this, wh- what are neurons? You know, I, I've, I've used the word neurons and all this stuff, but I realize like, I'm, I don't really, I don't really kind of know exactly what that is. Is it, is there like, like electrical simple... impulses okay. in the brain and they're connected through what's called synapses, which are like spaces between them. Sure. So that's how that's a pathway is neurons connected to neurons through synapses in the brain. So when you say pathway or uh, rut or pattern or however you want to describe it, yeah. that's what we're talking about is these neurons in the brain. There's tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of neurons in the brain, but there also are only a certain amount, which is why the brain looks for those pathways strengthens the ones that are getting used, weakens the ones that aren't getting used. It's always trying to recycle and oh, trying to be yeah. efficient, trying to be effective. But it gets the problem is it doesn't know, is this pathway letting you thrive or not? It doesn't really care. It's just trying to be efficient. So is the pathway getting used? Well, let's strengthen that. So what tends to happen is anxiety, whatever or whatever, right? Fear, whatever it is, yeah. it starts in a maybe a very specific area. And over time, because it's getting used, it's getting stronger, it starts to spread across life in different ways. That makes so much sense. It just really seems so much more simple than it is. But I think that's kind of the truth of it. And I'm so thankful that modern medicine and science is catching up to how our brains work and how we can actually do this. Because you're saying the brain doesn't know the difference. It's just looking for a clear path. Yeah. And yeah. one that's strong and it'll make it stronger. So if you're using a path, the results in behavior actions or an outcome that you don't want, but that's what you're focused on, the brain will reinforce by putting those neurons on that path. Correct. Versus the other one that might be the more desirable one. So now it makes more sense to me too with what you're saying in terms of how words matter. The words that we use currently do make a difference. And that's something that I've thought, I've learned a lot about that more lately. And I've been fascinated with it because you hear like, well, you know, you shouldn't say I have this or that as if that's like, I'm, you know, I'm holding on to all these things that I don't want, but change your wording around it, which is funny because when we were kids, sometimes, you know, teachers would say, well, you know, just try to refocus you on something, refocus you on something, something that's different. It's absolutely fascinating to me. I'm going to make sure I put that link in the show notes after where people can go to get those those two items. Can you share about that again? Yeah. Uh, so the link is xfactorhypnosis.com slash Tonka Talk. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be two free gifts in there. Yeah. And it's One, not set up now, but it will be in a little bit. I'll do it as soon as we get off. As soon as yeah. I get off this call, I'll set it up. So the the first one is that relaxation breath, that relaxed breath that I talked about early on. Sure. And I've got a video that walks you through it. I've got written instructions that walk you through it, give you some of the best practices and and kind of let you have the experience. Tell you tells you how to best use this in your day. That's one of the gifts. The second one is a hypnotic guided meditation. It's 10 minutes long and it takes you into a relaxed state in just about 10 minutes. Uh, the idea I, behind I that is that. the relaxation response, just going into a relaxed response starts to activate healing in the body. So is that why we feel so much better often when we're on vacation or, you know, you go up to a cabin, you go to a beach, you go to a lake, you change your environment. And I think with most people, we immediately just kind of melt. Yeah. Once you get really, to where you really relax. Really is that why? And then that's certainly one of the reasons for sure. 
Like the, you know, the nervous system has two parts. It has the, the sympathetic, which is fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And then it has a rest and digest. That's parasympathetic. And this rest and digest, that is where we want to be. That yeah. is going to let you function at your highest level. It's going to give you the most resilience so that when you're even in a high stress situation, if you're coming from here, yeah, you just, you're going to just be able to respond the way you want to in a calm, relaxed way. That's going to be functional instead of the automatic reaction where you're anxious yeah. and you're not even really functioning anymore. Right. That's fight or flight. That's just survival. I got to, mm -hmm. I got to get through this or I'm going to die. It really puts so much power. It empowers people. That's what I like about it and and the type of work that you're doing because it just gives people an opportunity to, like you said, just even with that simple thing, those breathing techniques to kind of just lower that fight or flight and be able to be more in control of the situation and, and be more present about it. Because you're right, when we're in that fight or flight, we're not being present. We're actually over here thinking of all the reasons why this is happening and what an idiot I am or this, this, all the, things, all the right? noise. Whatever your way is. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely well, fascinating. I, I spent a lot of years of my life feeling disempowered and I've made it a high priority to be empowered and to help other people find their own empowerment. Like that's that's my jam. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's absolutely amazing. I'm going to, again, in the show, show notes, I'll share where to be able to reach you and learn more. And that link as well, where people can go to get two free gifts. If you're listening to this on the podcast for Tonka Talk, you can go ahead and watch the video over on Facebook on the Tonka Talk Community and Connection Facebook page. And if you're watching this on Facebook and you want to listen to it later, you can always go to the Tonka Talk podcast. Because again, we share the ways people create community and connection. And oftentimes that starts with taking care of ourselves. Because I feel, my, at least in my experience, the more I can be in a better place, the better I can show up for other people. And the happier that I was, the calmer that I can be, the better I can be in my community. So I think these conversations are really so important. And there's so many people that are struggling with these things that, you know, that we all do. So I love having the conversation about it. So thank you so much, Joshua, for joining. Thank you, everybody, for joined us, who joined us over in the live on Facebook. If you haven't already, please make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Really appreciate it. It helps out a ton. Always bring your questions. Joshua, thank you. Hold tight. And everyone else, I will talk to you later.